Hello all, Rick here with a cultural index looking today at a not-so-prominent species of Star Trek, the Barzan, people of the Alpha Quadrant. I will be using canon information as well as Apocrypha to fill in some details where appropriate, but there really isn't that much extra outside of the shows this time. So, thanks for watching and let's get started. According to my cutting-edge research skills, the Barzan is a 400-metre container and cargo vessel and the first of six 18,800 TEU ships built for the United Arab Shipping Company and is one of the largest... Wait... Uh, no, that's the wrong one. <clears throat> the Barzan are from a planet of the same name, which I have a theory is simply the Universal Translator acting on a basic level to assign a recognisable name. Before we look at their biology, let's look at the planet itself. The classification of the planet is a little vague, as it is described as an M-class world, yet its atmosphere is toxic to most humanoid life, seemingly invalidating the label as a humanoid-friendly world. The planet's atmosphere is very dense and a thick greenish colour, which either hints at a very different sun or perhaps the high concentration of some gas such as chlorine in the atmosphere. This would certainly make the atmosphere toxic to most humanoid standard life forms, even if everything else was regarded as habitable and its composition otherwise included oxygen. The planet was orbited by more than two moons, although two were called Arma and Tolpra. The biology of the Barzan people was adapted to their world, so much so that when they departed Barzan II, several changes had to occur. The first was a cosmetic alteration of their eye colour when they spent long periods of time away from their native atmosphere, presumably some reaction. The second was the addition of a breathing device that would compensate by introducing the gases that others would find toxic directly into their mouths so that they could continue to breathe the mixture they were evolved for. This shows that they didn't entirely rely on a completely different atmospheric composition as they still metabolised the standard oxygen-nitrogen mixture, just a bit spicier than most humanoid life's tolerances. These breathing apparatus were either worn on the face or surgically attached, if the Barzan in question would be spending a great deal of time away from their planet. Their blood was also black in colour, evidence of their evolution to deal with whatever the different gases were. A Barzan without their breathers, in a standard M-class environment, became disorientated and short on breath, and would soon lapse into unconsciousness, but it was not immediately fatal. By the 32nd century, their breathers were far less intrusive, and there was always the option of genetic modification. Barzan II was a relatively resource-poor planet, and although they had an interstellar knowledge and capability, the Barzan people lacked any sort of manned space exploration program. However, when they became aware of other species, it seems they established ties of trade and commerce among them, becoming quickly reliant on outside imports to sustain their population and way of living beyond what their meagre planet could provide. As of the mid-23rd century, the Federation was aware of the Barzan people, and had even enlisted at least one individual into Starfleet who served on the USS Enterprise and later Discovery. This was not common, however, as Barzan was not a Federation member world, although Starfleet would have provided a way for the Barzan people to easily piggyback on another interstellar organisation. Attention was drawn to Barzan II in 2366 when they discovered a wormhole within their own system that seemed stable and provided a link to the Gamma Quadrant covering a hundred year journey in seconds. As they still lacked a strong interstellar presence, they opted instead to sell the rights of the wormhole to bolster the trade on which they relied. This ultimately fell through as the wormhole was revealed to be only stable at the Barzan's end, while the other end flitted about the galaxy. Further unfortunates are apparent when readings reveal that even the more stable end will eventually vanish too, but at least the Barzans do open up some degree of trade with the Chrysalians. Despite this, it shows the first early signs of interest in the United Federation of Planets from the Barzan people, and they joined sometime in the 25th century. Their government was the Barzan Planetary Republic, and the name suggests a single planet-wide unified government, coincidentally one of the requiring factors in Federation membership. 
it seems that despite their poor resources, the Barzan people had managed to work together to survive, rather than descending into opportunistic warfare. Their elected leader was called the Premier, and responsible for the deals they conducted among other powers. The sparse resources of their planet created a cultural effect of loyalty, diligence, and close familial ties, as they looked out for one another. It was a given understanding that a person may be put through discomfort, but in so doing they might lessen the burden on others, and therefore share in the hardship. This was a noted observation in the few Barzan met outside of their homeworld, that they carried this level of responsibility and duty with them, so ingrained it was. This made them suited for roles such as security, although they could apply themselves to any field of study with wholehearted dedication. The Barzan language makes use of a lot of ejective consonants, which is all very breathy sounding sha or ta noises, and their naming convention seemingly had two names, although the only example we have of this is from the aforementioned Starfleet officer D. Nan, and we don't even know what the D stands for, so this could be something she adopted for Starfleet records or something. Other Barzan names included Tolpra, Bahavani, Attis, and Amna and these were the only terms used to identify an individual, so we do not know if there is a difference between a surname and first names. And this is about it when it comes to the Barzan people, although I can make a couple of guesses. It seems that they are very proud of their homeworld, Barzan 2, despite its tough living and resource-poor status. Even by the late 24th century, they had elected to eschew expanding into other colony worlds, in order to attempt to develop and prosper their own, and refrain from exploration initiatives that many other planets strived for, even though they would benefit greatly from it. It could quite simply be that their resources are so limited that they cannot afford to invest in exploration at all, but if that is the case then joining something like Starfleet and the UFP seems like an obvious solution. Yet again, this is something they refrained from doing for two centuries, despite being well on their way to meeting the joining criteria and the benefits they stood to gain. I can only assume that they quite simply did not want to change who they were, and the struggle against the odds to survive had unified them as a people, and instilled them with this innate level of responsibility, so what would happen to them if that burden was eased? Well, fortunately, it looks like they have a strong future ahead of them, and that joining the UFP didn't change who they were culturally all that much. So, as of the last votes for the next index, the Belters actually did relatively well with only a 10% difference between the two, and as someone commented, if we take into account the preference for Trek that this channel has, then the Belters would have taken the lead easily. So I think I'm going to cover them next at some point, but I also want to do them justice. So they'll be up soon, but in the meantime, here's a vote for another potential choice for the next index. Either a similarly sounding Star Trek species, the Benzites, or the Bothans from Star Wars, because they also begin with a B. Thank you for watching, I've been Rick, and I hope to see you back for another video. Goodbye.